The Dickheads are presented in color. Hello and welcome to the Dickheads podcast. Our pink laser beam of truth is beaming to your brain hole via the United Kingdom. And psychologist Chris Firth is joining us on the podcast. We're super excited to have Chris here today on Dickheads because he is one of the most noted psychologists on the issue of brain mapping, and he's written several books on the subject. Uh, Chris, how did you get into science and uh, the direction that you went with psychology? Yeah, I should first correct you, so the name is Chris Frith. Frith, I'm sorry. I blame this on Colin Firth, who's messed up my life ever since he became <laughs> Yes, I got into psychology basically because I was originally going to be a physicist. Um, I went to university and I read physics and that maths and things like that. And it was clearly much too difficult. And the equipment was much too expensive. Right. Whereas psychology, I at that time, could do with pencil and paper. And you got into um, issues with the brain and mapping the brain and like real deep yeah. stuff with the science towards the brain. How did that happen? Well, that happened much later in the sense that's going right back to the physics, which is very odd. So I started off by being a clinical psychologist mm -hmm. and that's how I was first introduced to people with schizophrenia and so mm -hmm. on. And then I went into research because they decided I wasn't fit to be a clinician and um, I, in fact, joined a unit which was purpose of which was to study schizophrenia and relationships between the brain and the mind. And at that point, brain imaging was invented. It was in about 19, late 80s, early 90s. And I was in the right place at the right time to be in one of the first new brain imaging units, first using PET and then fMRI. Mm -hmm. And brain imaging changed everything for how our understanding of how the brain works, right? Well, that's what we thought would happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether it really did. It certainly changed things dramatically because one of the things I used to do was a so-called neuropsychology, mm -hmm. which meant if you were working in a neurology hospital, for example, a neurologist might say, this patient's just come in and they've had a stroke or they've been hit by something or something and they have these strange symptoms can you examine them and tell us where the brain injury is most likely to be mm. and then you would do your tests and you would say yes i think it's in the right parietal cortex or something like that and then suddenly these imaging machines appeared and they didn't ask us anymore because they could actually scan the brain and see where the image damage was precisely mm -hmm. so that was a big change but on the other hand, for us, it meant we used to have, we used to have these wonderful models which said this is this, this is the psychological aspects, and it depends on these components in the information processing stream, and um, on the basis of studying patients with lesions, we think these components are in these bits of the brain. But then we could actually put undamaged people into the scanner and give them peculiar tasks to do and see which bits of the brain lit up. Mm. Well, you know, it, it's, inter it's interesting too because our brains drive everything and it it's, contains everything that we are and it moves our body, but yeah. often people don't really think about the brain. Um, you know, it's something that you have to kind of remind people that this is this this is an important thing to understand how it works, right? Well, that was certainly true for me because in the, originally when I was a psychologist, I didn't think about the brain at all mm -hmm. until I started working on schizophrenia and my colleagues were biochemists and anatomists and psychiatrists and so on. And there was this extraordinary relationship to the brain because, as you probably know, you can reduce the severity of hallucinations and delusions by giving people dopamine blocking drugs so why is and not others so why is that this is a strange connection between drugs and subjective experience 
So I suddenly realized that what psychologists were doing was actually studying how the brain works. Now, of course, we're going to talk about this through the context of our boy Phil and yes. everything that he did. And um, But so much of his work has to do with our perceptions of reality, which is something you, that you've written about quite yeah. a bit. You had, um, had a book specifically on the subject. Maybe you could tell our listeners about, about this book. Yes, well, I wanted to try and write a more to get a wider audience than other scientists. So I tried to write a popular book, which didn't quite succeed, at least in terms of sales, um, called Making Up the Mind. And uh, this was precisely to try and talk about the relationship between the mind and the brain. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I should state for your, for the listeners is that I'm a born again Bayesian. If that, and okay. Thomas Bayes was an obscure mathematician and clergyman in the 18th century who invented something called Bayes' theorem, which was ignored until what, 50 years ago, and has suddenly become really big. And this explains to some extent how perception works. And the book was partly to talk about, um, to describe these new ideas. And in essence, we are not like a camera. So it's not that information comes in and then we interpret it gradually and it becomes more and more abstract until we know what we're looking at it starts the other way around so that we have a prior idea of what we're going to see mm -hmm. or hear or whatever it may be. And then what we're trying to do, because of course our senses are very crude, we're trying to work out what is it out there that would give us this particular sensory experience. And to do that, we have to have a prior idea of what's out there. And then we see whether our prior idea fits with what's actually coming in. And we adjust our experience as it as things go on so we get a better and better idea of what's really out there. But we're not seeing reality. What we're experiencing is our model of reality. Mm -hmm. Luckily, most of the time it's correct. So what you're saying basically is that if something outside of our grasp of reality shows up, we might not even be able to translate it in, in the yes. moment. There's a very nice example of this, which you can all experience. If you take a mask of a face mm -hmm. and you slowly rotate it, I mean, you can find this on the internet, but if you look at the mask from the back, mm -hmm. what you're seeing is an inverted face. Mm. You get me? But you can't see that. <laughs> you reverse <Right>. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you touched on something there that I, I want to... Maybe, I don't know if you were hinting to a bigger thing, but is there a difference between the brain and the mind? Because I saw, I, they saw you kind of separate them in the way you talked about them. And if there is, or, or am I just crazy? <laughs> well, it depends how you think about it. I mean, obviously, everything that happens in our mind comes via the brain. Mm -hmm. But... More recently, I'm very fascinated by the effects of culture. So that the mind is very much affected by the culture we're, we're embedded in. And the brain is the conduit, as it were, that makes this difference to us. So that in a sense, our, our brains change as a result of our upbringing. So, I mean, a good example of this is reading and writing, because reading and writing has only invented, what was it, a few thousand years ago, and universal literacy only about 100 years ago. So clearly our brain hasn't evolved to read and write. Mm. But we do it. And you can actually show that learning to read and write alters your brain. Right, which is that whole Philip K. Dick quote about, you know, if you want to um, affect reality, it's how you use words. At, yeah, yeah. So where does the study of illusions come into this? Because I think how we uh, fool the brain with visual illusion can, can teach us a lot about how the brain functions. Am I correct? Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, so Bay Bayesians like to talk about things called priors, which basically means what you expect, determining to some extent what you see. 
And most illusions can be explained in terms of our expectations. And I just described to you the hollow mask illusion. Mm -hmm. Because we have this incredibly strong expectation that faces are, the, are not convex. Right. And, the, and the, most of the illusions can be explained in this way. And, and many of them, the visual illusions are because we are, of course, when we perceive things, we're doing it in 3D. Mm -hmm. We perceive a 3D world, but of course on our, our retinas we only have two dimensions. So we're constantly having to work out the 3D, 3D structure of space on the basis of these two-dimensional inputs. And again, you, you can make mistakes. And there's something like, what's it called? The, um, there's the one about the railway lines. So if you have two parallel lines and you put bars between them, the ones at the top look longer than the ones at the bottom, even though they're exactly the same length. Mm. That's because you're perceiving this as if it was a railway line going into the distance. I so see. they're further away. So that's an example of misperceiving 2D as 3D. Right, and, and because our inputs are, and especially now that we live so much of our lives online, I think... <laughs> The, it's even worse. Yeah. yeah, it's even worse for, for how we could be fooled. And um, PKD played with this in his novel Time on a Joint, which was, you know, kind of famously ripped off by The Truman Show uh, a yeah. year later. But, you know, the whole um, storyline or the twist of, of Time on a Joint is, is that, you know, this main character is so important to the society and everything is an illusion built around yeah. him. Yeah and fooling him. But um, what do you think about the whole idea that uh, of that he was working with, with a mass illusion? Um, do you think that's possible? Do you think that, um, that I don't know, I, I'm just going to let you riff on that. <laughs> no, I think that's what mainly attracted me to reading his novels is this idea that what you're perceiving is actually wrong. And that there's a, as he put it, a penultimate truth. Mm hmm we never actually quite arrive at. So and, let's talk, yeah, let's let's get into that then. About how did you discover Philip K. Dick, and about what time did you read him? What was your first book that you read of his? Oh, that's a good. Well, I know when I was, no, was it just after I finished my PhD, my wife and I went to evening courses, mm -hmm. which in those days you could do nowadays because of austerity, you can't. And we went to an evening course on science fiction run by someone called Philip Strick, who published some anthologies. Um, and that's where I was introduced to Philip K. Dick and all sorts of other people. I was particularly a fan of J.G. Ballard at mm -hmm. that time. We're big Ballard fans here at, at the podcast too, so... And um, But I don't remember, uh, probably, I wouldn't be surprised if Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep was the first one I read. Then I read most of them. Philip K. Strick, who was teaching us, was a bit um, iffy about Philip K. Dick, and he referred to one of his books as being called the Galactic, A Galactic Pot Boiler. <laughs> so you said, you've said before that you were you were influenced in your work by Philip K. Dick. What do you think is the biggest influence that Philip K. Dick had on, you know, the work that you do with the brain? Well, it was particularly when I was working with people with schizophrenia, because the problem there, if you try and relate that to the brain, is easy to explain why someone is, say, blind or has a can't see color or um, has a patch of their visual field missing, because you can say, well, the brain has been damaged and there's a bit missing, and that can explain it. But how do you explain what we call the positive illusions? That is to say, seeing things that are not actually there, to put it crudely. And um, the Bayesian approach allows you to explain that, because you can say, well, the, whenever we see things, we're seeing things that are not actually there, because we are um, constructing what might be out there on the basis of our sensory input. And if we have too strong a prior expectation of what we're going to see, that may determine what we see more than the evidence that's coming in. So this, and this whole idea that what we see may not correspond to reality, I think is very critical for 
understanding things like hallucinations. Well, and then that leads me to the cross section here because, you know, um, instances that happened in Phil's life and the amount of drugs yeah. that he took and, and, and whatever that people th- often try to dismiss Phil as crazy. And, but what I think is really interesting and in, in, in what you were just saying is that um, he's a creative thinker, obviously he's a writer and mm. it is a lot of what schizophrenia is, is the brain filling in those, those holes of how people perceive reality. Is, is that a good way to explain schizophrenia? Because, you know, I'm not an expert. But. No, this is where I have trouble. I think that's a very good ex- way of explaining how the brain fills things in to create reality. But I'm not entirely convinced that this is, relates to schizophrenia, at least as I understand it. Mm. So when, certainly in Martian time slip, when the one of the people is, it has various schizophrenic episodes, mm-hmm. um, which are described as seizures and things like that, that's not the sort of schizophrenia that I used to study. And likewise, the sorts of hallucinations you get with LSD and that Dick described after having these mega, mega vitamins or whatever it was, where you see lots of coloured graphics and Kandinsky's and things. That's not the kind of hallucination that people with schizophrenia typically have. So, so, so I think he's, I think he's, he's absolutely on the ball when he's describing how the brain works and how perception occurs. But I don't think it necessarily relates to schizophrenia. As I am, as we d- diagnose it these days. Well, and that that leads me to an interesting question because I think people have the, lot. There's a popular perception of schizophrenia, and there's yes. like the academic truth of schizophrenia. And I think it would do a service to to get your take on what's the difference between the stereotype and and the reality of schizophrenia. Well, the first thing that most people think about is split personality. And that's something completely different. When it's a sad misfortune that Bloiler called it schizophrenia, but he didn't mean having more than one personality. He meant a split between different aspects of the same mind. Like you would have, there's one symptom called, gosh, I'm losing my memory, um, inappropriate affect where you get a distinction where there's a, the link between your affective feelings and your cognition seem to go wrong. Um, so the standard diagnosis of schizophrenia these days is that you have to have hallucinations of certain kinds, which is typically hearing voices, and they're usually voices saying nasty things about you. They can also be, you can hear voices describing what you're doing, you can hear your own thoughts spoken aloud. And then you have the delusions of which the paranoid ones are widely known. But there are other ones particularly just to me, like the so-called delusion of control, where the patient says, We're never up, well, I'm not doing things. There's some alien force that's making me make these, which can be completely trivial actions, like combing my hair or something. But it's not me. So those are the some of the typical kinds of symptoms. And the other feature of schizophrenia is that it is associated usually with extremely debilitating in the sense that you can't function very well. Mm. So I would rule out Philip K. Dick on the grounds that if you were schizophrenic, you wouldn't write 41 novels or whatever it was. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that means helped a little bit on the, on the volume, but, uh, but yes, uh, um, yeah, and, and, and I, I did give you a little hint that I was definitely going to ask, uh, you know, whether you think that, uh, because he flirted with the idea that he was schizophrenic. Uh, certainly in his life, he had himself committed uh, more than once. Uh, there's a famous story that Tim Powers, how he picked up Phil in Orange County one time from after he had committed himself and then asked to be picked up. And Tim tells the story about how when he got in the car, Phil looked at him and said, Tim, if there was a, 
a truth so powerful that it instantly drove everyone mad who learned it. Would you want me to tell you? And <laughs> said to him, no, Phil, <laughs> I don't want you to tell me. <laughs> and, uh, which was, you know, a great story. And, uh, but it, it showed that, you know, his, he had, he had concerns that he was not mentally stable and, and, and yeah. novels like Martian time slip show that he was really invested in exploring how schizophrenia worked. But you're saying spectrum, there's different versions of it. Is yeah, sure. And what I just, I was reading, because of your email, I started to read Martian Times to begin. And I was, which I didn't finish, but I was, what I was most struck by is his talking about autism. Mm -hmm. Because Manfred in that novel is autistic. Well, the influence there was is that they, he and Nancy had a friend who had an autistic <laughs> child that they took care of or they babysat for from time to time. So he had... Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because I thought his description of autism was extremely accurate. Mm -hmm. And I, my claim here is that my wife, Uta, is an expert on autism <laughs> and did her PhD on it. And... At that time, so this would have been in the mid-60s, it was almost unknown, certainly in the UK. So I was fascinated about how Phil, who wrote this in 63, I think, could have a, such an accurate picture of autism. Right. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. I uh, worked for 20 years with kids with autism myself, so uh, I, uh, I, I, I felt the same way. And mm. my, um, my stepmother has been in the field uh, oh, right. since before the, the word, the, the term, you know, they had the term autism. So uh, I, I, I was, I had the same reaction when I uh, reread Martian Time Slip for the podcast. And yeah. um, it, it is really um, a testament to, to what he was doing there. Um, we'll come back to Martian Time Slip in a little bit. Um, I, I, in Eye in the Sky, which is a, 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 an early favorite of mine, the book is about the kind of the twist of the book is that the characters are trapped inside other people's perceptions. It's an alternate reality book, but they're inside someone's perception. How much of how we see the world is based on our individual perception and how different? I, well, I'm very interested currently in the idea I should say we're trying to write another popular book, which I will, when we, which is due in June 2016. Um, <laughs> Only but, that far in the future? <laughs> um, I'm very interested in, this is basic perception. I mean, just visual perception is influenced by culture. Mm. So that what culture does is make us much more uniform in the way we perceive things than we realize. And of course that makes communication easier. Mm -hmm. And the examples you can find of this is, for example, I've been very interested in synesthesia, which we might get back to when we talk about um, um, androids and so on. But what is, and so in synesthesia, for example, you have people who see words in different colors or musicians who have chords have different colours. And the fascinating thing is if you go and give a lecture about synesthesia, you're bound to get one or two people who come up afterward and say, I thought everybody was like that. Right. And it's the same, same with colour blindness. So we have a friend who's colour blind, and he describes that he didn't know he was colour blind until he was about 25 and being a medic, and they kept complaining that he was filling in the wrong forms, and they say, you're supposed to use this for the red forms, and this is for the green forms, and he <laughs> had never realised that there were different coloured forms. So this is an example of people who think they're seeing the world in the same way as everybody else, but they're not. And, of course, the classic example of this is the, fame, the dress, which you must remember, which went viral on Twitter, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when that happened. Some yeah. people suddenly realized that some people were seeing it in one set of colors and another lot were seeing it in a completely different set of colors. So it seems like Phil was really ahead of, of the curve with Eye in the Sky that he was, yeah. 
um, exploring the idea that your the way you access culture completely changes how you perceive the world entirely. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm, and I'm just talking about vision. When you get to more abstract things like how you see politics or something, it's going to be a much bigger effect. So, okay, back to Martian time sled. I have this quote from Philip K. Dick, and I sent it to you, but I, w- I want to read it for um, our listeners. Uh, in reference to Martian time slip, he said, in fact, schizophrenia could be evidence for my system. He was talking about Vallis. It is an instance of the malfunction of that system and with my system in mind can be easily understood in Martian time slip. I saw it as a breakdown of proper time functioning, which was closed. So he saw Martian time slip, this idea of this breakdown of time, which is almost physics. But how our brain perceives time is also a part of how we live in the, in the world, correct? So wh- where does this, the, the connection between physics and the brain come together? Well, yes, I have thought about this. And I, I would put it slightly differently. And I would relate it more to autism than to schizophrenia. And, um, and in fact, this is, relates to the theory of this psychiatrist called Glaub, was it? I think, yeah. And he says, you know, you, the trouble with the autistic people is that everything happens too fast. And if you slowed things down, they would be able to understand better. And I wonder if it's that aspect of time that's interesting. So if I can digress a bit, um, going back to, to speech... Speech depends on an incredibly rapid input of auditory signals. And in fact, the components of it are far too fast for us to actually experience. And you can do nice experiments presenting three things together and people don't know what order they came in. And the way we, they, we deal with this is we turn it into phonemes, which are longer chunks. And this happens in the first two or three years of life. And you have this interest phenomenon that the newborn child can, ex- can hear all possible phonemes, but by the time they're two and a half, they've got rid of all the ones that don't occur in their mother tongue, so that Japanese people can't tell the difference between L's and R's. Certain German people can't tell the difference between hard S's and soft S's, as in P's and P's. And that, of course, enables us to cut to, make, to simplify the stream of speech as it comes in. We're effectively slowing it down by listening just to the phonemes and not to the complex structure that underlies the phonemes. And I'm wondering whether some of these drug effects that you hear about puts us back into the original stream that is too difficult to comprehend. And that I can, there's a sort of anecdotal account of this. So you know that people who have too much alcohol supposedly see pink elephants <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Now, the reason, theory i don't know if it's true but <laughs> i've never experienced this but you can explain it neatly and probably incorrectly as you probably know the the human retina is the wrong way around in the sense that you have the light sensitive cells at the back and the blood vessels that feed the energy to them are in front which is crazy. So you have to have this blind spot where all the blood vessels have to go through a hole where the, where the sense receptors are not there, so you find it. So you have all these very small blood vessels in front of your eye, as it were, which, of course, you suppress. But too much alcohol reduces the suppression and you start seeing them. Hence the pink elephants. <laughs> Interesting. Well, um, now, one of the things that um, in our prep for this, I sent you the video of um, Phil's speech in France in 1977. And some background on that is that uh, Phil um, tried to cancel out. and, And even though he was the guest of honor, he was very nervous about going, almost did not go. And then went on to drop this bomb with the speech 
where he basically said, and and several times in the speech, he says, I'm not joking. Um, I yeah. think we are in a simulated reality. And these yeah. are the reasons why I think we, you know, see these glitches and which basically the matrix, because I mean, he was talking about the matrix years before it became an action movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, his, I, I wonder what your um, take on watching that speech was because a lot of people have taken it as, you know, you can, it's, it's also in how you perceive it because some people say like, wow, look how on the ball he was like these really intelligent things he's thinking about and these ways he's questioning reality. And then there's other people that are like, well, look, it's a sign that he's nuts, you know? Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's one or the other. I, I think it's a brilliant speech, but I wonder what you thought watching it. Well, I agree that the way he presents it, he seems extremely with it and it's all completely logical and beautifully presented and he interacts with the translator and all that perfectly, better than I would. Um, and I guess I, would, I thought, again, he was very prescient. So I don't agree with him that there are parallel worlds that we can enter. But I do agree with him it, which is roughly what we were just talking about, that we all live in slightly parallel worlds where we all see the world slightly differently and we somehow manage to accommodate ourselves and agree with each other and set when things go badly wrong. Um, like in Trolley Ardeur, I mean, certain kinds of madness where you can get even quite normal people, if that's the right word, agreeing with this view of reality. I mean, the worst case of this is the Jonestown massacre, where all these people had a very strange view of reality. So in that sense, he's right in that there are these parallel universes that we're all living in. But out there, I think there is one single real one, which we're trying to contact. The other thing I thought was extremely interesting, which I mentioned before, and this all goes with the Bayesian idea that what we perceive are our beliefs of the world and not the real world, so the beliefs can be slightly different. And this leads to the problem of how do we know, how do we distinguish between what we're imagining and what we're perceiving? Because one of the things that brain imaging showed us is that if we imagine something or we perceive something or we think about something, the same bits of the brain light up. So there's a problem of distinguishing what's imagined from what's real. So he, he, yeah. in the context there, um, specifically, I think people point to Flow My Tears, the policeman said, that yeah. is a book that he kind of suggested that he was seeing this world or that he was experiencing part of this world and then writing about it. We don't know how much this was Phil creating a persona yeah. or because he seems very like you said he seems very together and and yeah. very articulate in that speech so we we it, it's hard to to think that he you know would be not perceiving reality but he also you know through the man in the high castle suggested that that you know people kind of transfer between these worlds and that was like a concept that he he was kind of giving um would it be possible for someone to delude themselves to believe these things and still be able to function? Yes, I think so. I mean, the other thing I thought was extremely interesting in that talk, though I can't quite remember it properly, is he talked about there's a sort of programmer that's rewriting things. So the past is changing. And that, of course fits very well with current ideas about our episodic memory, which is it's reconstructed. And that's how false memories are so easily created. Oh, so we're perce we, we perceive the past incorrectly because we're editing it in our own mind. Yeah, that's right. And there's some very nice work by my friend Eleanor McGuire, who studied people with amnesia, who have a problem with reconstructing their past demonstrating they also have problems in imagining the future. So that the same process of reconstruction applies both to recreating our past and creating our future. And so I'm wondering too, as a long time uh, fan of Phil's work, was this the first time you ever saw a video of him talking or, or yes. yeah. yeah. And so, 
Yeah, it must have, because I know a lot of these things are, there's more interviews out there that are available on YouTube and I highly recommend them, but um, it, how was that experience of, of seeing him for the first time, like after reading his books? Well, he is. He was much more with it than I expected. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree, too. The first couple times I listened to interviews with him and, you know, uh, I expected something a little different, too. <laughs> Let's talk about... So he has the story Imposter, which was, was made into a film in the 90s. Um, and, you know, it's very much about the idea of this, you know person that does not realize that they've been artificially replaced how hard do you think it would be to 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 really down to a deep level fool the brain um into of somebody who is real but making them believe that they they are not well there is a phenomenon called derealization i mean a psychiatric symptom where people come to believe that they're not real and there's Cotard syndrome where they believe that they're dead whatever so these sorts of things can happen um, and there's also Capgras syndrome which is the other way round which is where you firmly believe that your wife usually has been replaced by a machine mm-hmm. well he played with that as far back as the father yeah. thing yeah, yeah. How easily, I mean, we, we already talked a little bit about the idea that memories, that we falsify our own memories. Um, mm. Is it something that science could eventually implant memories? Is that something that science is working on? It is, indeed. Um, you can now do it in mice, I think, or possibly rats. Um, you know about optogenetics, no, I'm not familiar with it, but I'm sure most of our listeners aren't either, so hit us. <laughs> you can, I mean, in the olden days, all you could, the way you studied the brain was making holes in it, which is somebody described as trying to discover how a car works by attacking it with an axe. But the, um, um, nowadays, you can insert, this is, all sounds, this is all true, you can insert viruses into animals so that particular neurons change their properties so that you can make them fire by putting in blue light, say. So you can turn neurons on and off by putting in blue light. And in this way, you can actually implant, you can create fear memories directly without the animal having to experience you having an electric shock in this particular place, whatever it may be. So that is happening, that has happened. Now, whether you can the, fine. <laughs> <laughs> and a co- friend of mine, Hakwan Lau, has been doing the opposite sort of thing. So he is working on can you remove unpleasant memories? And this is done by, I mean, the way you, this is almost like behavior therapy. So if you have somebody who's afraid of dogs, one way to do this is to make them experience dogs with nothing nasty happening. But that's quite difficult to make them take up, as it were. But he has this clever way you can you can use brain imaging and you can get people to you can use neurofeedback. So you can say, right, I want you to discover how to make this, you know, the circle on the screen get smaller and smaller by thinking in the right way. And you can actually get people who can control their brain activity in this way. <clears throat> And then you can teach them to control their brain activity in such a way as to make dogs less frightening without actually needing them to present them with a dog. So that sort of thing is on the verge of happening. I haven't described that very well, but you're using neurofeedback in this. (laughs) Well, um, yeah, yeah, and and I think, um, again, that's another thing that Phil was really ahead of the curve on, the idea that you could just, I mean, he's just looking at it as, you know, science will figure it out. I'm just going to say it's going to happen. But scientists are actually now doing, you know, doing this to figure out how to do this in, in, in ways that are, I don't know, to me, the idea of implanting fears 
is is super frightening and horrible <laughs> sounding, but uh, you know it is what it is. Um, so in the three stigmata of Palmer Aldridge, which is personally like most of us here at the podcast believe that it is Phil's masterpiece, and it is very much about well, it's about many things, but a huge part of the book is that you know these colonists are taking these drugs, Chu Z, Candy. Mm-hmm to try and uh, deal with living in these completely horrible situations. When he was writing that, he was definitely looking at the intersection between drugs and mysticism. Um, I'm wondering what somebody who researches the brain thinks about um, this, these seekers who use drugs to try and have these mystical experiences. Like, I don't know, I'm a drug-free person, so to me it seems like BS. Like, it seems like you're creating this chemical reactions in your brain. So it's definitely not a mystical experience to me. But I wonder how you feel about it as a scientist. Well, I have to confess that when I was young, like everybody else, I read Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception Mm -hmm. and was very interested by that. And Which was a huge influence on Three Stigmata. He said that, yeah. Um, My experience of drugs is very, very limited, but I have the advantage that being a scientist, I can ask my friends to put me in an experiment. So I've had large amounts of ketamine, for example, which is the nearest thing to schizophrenia, probably better than LSD. But what what is interesting is it's all coming back again. So I have colleagues now who are studying LSD effects in brain imaging machines, who are more and more suggesting that LSD might be useful for treating certain kinds of psychiatric disorders. Ketamine has suddenly discovered, been is claimed, and I'm not convinced yet, is a rapid way of removing depression. And of course, if you go to, as I used to go to conferences on consciousness, you will always have a session on some, is it Ayasca? This is this South American drug. Ayahuasca or something like that. So this is really becoming... Oh, ayahuasca? Ayahuasca, that's the one, yes. So this is becoming big again, and um, not so, And certainly it causes interesting experiences. And that may tell us something about how the brain works. That's interesting. Um, and I think when that research comes in and when we know more about it, like it's going to put a different light on... Uh, well, again, it's. I think it's a situation where Phil was out of the curve, right? Yes, definitely, yeah. All right, so we'll get down to the final round here, which is um, Artificial Persons, Blade Runner, and Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is how I found you because I saw an article where you were commenting on the Void Comp Test. Um, how do you feel about the, the concept that empathy is the key to determining who is human and who is not like, um, you know, obviously Phil was writing this. He wrote it in 1966, came out in 68, but um, you know, I'm an animal rights person. So like, I love the idea of of the Voicom test and, and, and that, but I, but also as animal rights people, I think most human beings would fail that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) No, I, 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 I read this again. And I was very interested because the androids are actually psychopaths, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. He, and he describes that he explicitly said, well, replicants, we should call them, shouldn't we? And he actually describes them as solitary predators at one point. The, the, last, the worst story I had about this is a friend of mine who was studying them. So she would go to prisons and she would have psychopathic murderers, and her control group would be ordinary garden variety murderers. Ordinary garden variety murderers, as, as a, yeah. <laughs> it describes one interview with, she was showing them faces with different emotions on, and one of the psychopaths said, oh, yes, I've seen that expression many times i never discovered what it means it's what people look like just before i hit them Oof. 
<laughs> Oof. <laughs> right. Well, we, we argued a bunch on, about Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep on our podcast about whether Phil was being negative or positive about the androids. Because in one sense, he's wanting us to have... And, and that's what I think is great about the nuance of the book is because he's trying to get us, in one sense, to have empathy for these other creatures. But in the other sense, like, you know, Deckard just wants money, yeah. you know, to get to get an actual animal and yeah. he's going to kill as many replicants in the book. It's Andes. He's going to kill as many Andes as, as he needs to, yeah. to, to get, to get there. And, and, and so it's an interesting dichotomy because he passed the empathy test in one sense, but he has no gumption with these artificial he, people taking them out. Yeah. No, I, 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 I got that impression too. By the end, I thought that the the Andes were non-empathic psychopaths. And for example, Rachel eventually kills his goat, if I remember right, if I'm not clear why. And um, they also... Yeah. <laughs> they also... They're it, it, it described as not even particularly helping each other. Right. And I'm wondering, and, and this may be getting too into the weeds with it, but I'm wondering how much being an artificial being with a short lifespan would would increase your aggressive tendencies because your survival mode is is so short. Um, and 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 so that's one of the things that I think was kind of going on there that gets overlooked. Um, but uh, so does the void comp test make any scientific sense? Like, oh yes, yeah, it's. Um... Well, I was going to say, I mean, with the with the, the real psychopaths, they do show a lack of empathy in the sense of not responding to things like fearful faces that most of us would respond to. So, in that, and of course, the Voigtkamp test is effectively Camp test is effectively a polygraph lie detector type test, except it's using slightly different inputs is using what I think blush detector and an eye muscle activity detector. And certainly if Phil had had access to fMRI, I'm sure that's what they would use because we've certainly shown that with fMRI you can test empathy in the sense of, I mean, I was involved in an experiment where you put people in the scanner, you have your friend, their friend sitting next to them and you give both the person in the scanner and the friend painful electric shocks. Ouch. <laughs> so that you, for the person in the scanner, you have what happens when they get an electric shock and you get what happens when they get this, the signal that their friend is going to get an electric shock. And the same brain areas become activated by getting the shock yourself as when you know your friend is getting the shock. And so do people who have more empathy have like a stronger reaction? Can you actually yes, see? You can see that to some extent. And what is, oh, yeah. what, is, what is much worse, though, is that you can then do it with people of different... It's been done in China. So basically, if, you, if the person you see getting the shock is Chinese and you're Chinese, you show the response. But the person you see getting the shock is Caucasian and you're Chinese, you don't get the, the, the empathy response. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, that's the same in Italy or, I mean, wherever. If it's an out group, you don't show the empathic response. Hmm. Now, you said in the article that I read that the Voigtkopf yeah. test, well, making scientific sense, and definitely we see that. But you said that you think that, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, that culture and how the androids view culture and society can say much more than empathy. And I'm wondering if you could expand on that because that's really interesting to me. Well, I think, I mean, the fact that you get this effect with an out group and not with an in group is in a sense cultural because it's culture that determines who we think the out group is mm. and who we think the in group is. And the, the Chinese study, they went then did some more work to try and say how could they get people to respond to the out group, and that was basically by putting them together in a team or something. So, and then the empathy response would come back 
if, if he was part of your team, mm. even though he was Caucasian or whatever it might be. So there are also, and I think also that, I mean, in a sense, nurserism, I mean, it all ties up with affiliation. So there's a relationship between empathy and affiliation in the sense that it's us, our group, we, it's we. And em- mercerism seemed to be a religion that was trying to create this we group, as it were. Mm. And it was interesting that they actually were suffering pain in the... in the little, going up the mountain and falling yeah. back, right. Yes, but actually the people who were holding the handle would actually feel the pain... That, so, that reminds me, the Penfield mood organ, right? Um, the Penfield, who it was named after, right? Um, uh, is it Walter Penfield? Um, yes. I believe, yeah. Um, uh, one of our listeners and uh, a very noted dickhead, David Gill, who um, does a, a blog about Phil K. Dick, uh, mentioned that it was his, that Penfield is his great uncle. Um, oh, it was really interesting, yeah. yeah. And he was talking about, and he and I had a little bit of a conversation online about the mood organ. And the mood organ is an interesting thing because it's an aspect of Dewey Android's dream of electric sheep. And yeah. I think it's underrated because it's a parallel. We have these beings who don't have real emotions in, in a way, like they're, they're, they're fake manufactured emotions. But humans are trying to use this device that they grab onto with both hands to give them actual feelings, to yeah. implant feelings. What did you think about the mood organ and how it related to the, to the book? Yes, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms. That's very interesting. But they were basically trying to, yes, they were trying to control their emotions. They were trying to get emotions that they wanted to have and weren't having at the moment. I mean, it's not that much different from taking your antidepressants, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but I hadn't really thought about it in relation to the Andes, who we don't really know in the book whether they feel emotions or not. Well, I think it's an underrated parallel that's going on in, yeah. in the book. Yeah. But, you know, because Blade Runner, of course, ejected that. You know, there's no yeah. food organ and all that, and the mercerism gets ejected too. But these are important parallels. Yes, absolutely. That, and I wonder whether the, as you were saying, that the fact that the Andes have this very short lifespan is why they cannot develop empathy in emotion because maybe that is something that we learn in the course of, to some extent in the course of our upbringing. You must know about mirror neurons and all this sort of thing, um, so which were recently discovered. But there's a, for example, there's a form of, so when we see someone doing something, our brain is automatically activated to do the same thing which is a f- form of empathy, if you like. And the idea is that this is, or some people think this is learned during the course of our upbringing. So, for example, we see our hands doing things and we, we start to connect what we see with what we do and we see other people doing things and we see expressions. And um, there's a particularly interesting form of synesthesia called touch, visual touch synesthesia. So these are people who say, when I see someone being touched, like on the face, I feel it on my own face. Mm. And we did actually an experiment where we put somebody like this in the scanner and indeed showed that when her face was touched, the face area lit up. And when she saw someone else's face being touched, the same area lit up in her brain. But what, to our surprise, we very properly had a control group of people who didn't have touch synesthesia, and they showed exactly the same thing, but they're not aware of it. Yeah, it's because of the short lifespan that that, that the androids have. I like this idea that they can't, like, develop, you know. But we we know that within, whether you're talking Blade Runner or you have the, the new androids that live longer or yeah, less yeah. detectable, they might be able to develop, um, you know, these emotions more fully. I think, I think that's a huge difference between the film Blade Runner and the book is yeah. that, like you said, in the book, the, the androids are just psychotic. They're, they're crazy. They, there's nothing to them. There's no tears in the rain speech being given by <laughs> the androids. 
And, um, and no, you, uh, you, mustn't, you mustn't say psychotic. They're okay. psychopathic. Psychopathic, okay. Yeah. No, I, I want to be corrected. Um, I want to say it correctly, but... But, you know, with the, I, I think that, um, you know, when people talk about Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, it's like it's easy to think of the movie, which is kind of more action oriented. But there are incredible themes um, under the surface working on a level that I think most people don't get reading this book. And I, I would say as a scientist who who studies the, the brain, have you ever been have you ever in the field and talking to others told other researchers that you've got to read philip k dick or you've got to read do androids dream of electric sheep that's kind of oh, what yeah yeah yes, I, I certainly do and in fact one of the when i still had a lab we had a lab ex, ex, expedition to see the film based on no what's it called i can't think it's the one using these where they infiltrate oh scanner darkly Yes, that was and that was done with a special film technique, wasn't it? Yeah, with, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Scanner Darkly, yeah. So we went to the lab. We went to see that film. So that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. How do you think? What do you think is the next um, frontier for how um, science fiction um, researches the brain in a way that actual science cannot do? That's a little question, I know. Well, yes. <laughs> well, we still can't do brain transplants. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which raises all sorts of interesting philosophical questions. There's a whole business of virtual reality and where that's going to go, but I guess that's already been done. I mean, in a sense, I mean, so philosophers like to talk about a vet, brain in a vat, and I guess Bayesians would say the brain is, already is in a vat. Um, and virtual reality is putting the brain in a vat into another vat. <clears throat> mm. that, that's how, I mean, that's all the matrix, I suppose. And that's, I guess I would be interested in, I mean, I'm particularly interested in something called the Wii mode, which is, and we've done a lot of work on people making decisions together mm. and how you can, in certain circumstances, you can make much better decisions together than you can with the best person working on their own. Hmm. But apparently this doesn't seem to work politically. Um, the, um, and there's an interesting analogy here because you have bees make group decisions, honeybees, so that the, when they move, when they swarm and they move to a new nesting site, scout bees go out examine the various possible nesting sites, come back, give information about how good they are in various ways, and then the whole swarm sits around for an hour or so, and then they go off to the, what is usually the best site on the basis of this incoming information. And the way they do this <coughs> is by the bees interacting with each other, which has been examined, and the claim is that the way bees interact with each other to make their group decisions is very similar to the way that neurons in the mammalian brain interact with each other to make their decision. So the, the swarm of bees is a bit like a mammal's brain. So you can then ask the next step, well, the next step is a swarm of humans. <laughs> right. What are they Thinking together, yeah. Together. I see. What, what are they? And the, another science thing, which is quite nice, is my friend Iriki in Japan taught monkeys to use rakes. So if the food is too far away, they can use they can learn to use a rake to get the food. <laughs> and um, the nice thing about and the monkeys never do this on their own. So you need a higher intelligence to release something that's available in the monkey's brain to for it to do something completely novel. So you again, you need the higher intelligence of somebody to sit down and teach them, like yeah. hey, you can get this food this way. So exactly the same thing. You can say there's clearly all sorts of abilities in the human brain that we don't know about, but we need a higher intelligence to release. Mm. Oh, I'm working on something like that in one of my books. Yeah. But uh, 
<laughs> uh, yeah. So how can the dickheads uh, find your work? Well, the, we have a, my wife and I have a website called frithmind.org, I think. I'm just checking. <laughs> so if you put in frithmind, you get it. Mm. And that has a series of blogs and tells about the new book that hasn't been written yet and um, our life and work and various things like that. Well, well, we want you to write that book because it sounds amazing. So um, I should I should let you get to that. But um, uh, Chris, it was awesome uh, learning out with you about Philip K. Dick. Uh, did, did I miss anything? Is there anything Philip K. Dick related that uh, you feel... Um, you have to get out there. <laughs> no, there was one note that I made in relation to the Andes being psychopaths is where Pris cuts the legs off the spider. Mm, great scene, yeah. There's a classic activity of conduct disordered children who grow up to be psychopaths. Mm, yeah, which, you know, um, is more commonly known now as the thing that how psychopaths treat animals is a, a sign mm-hmm. or indication, but in 1966. That was, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. It was very forward thinking. Yeah. 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 Phil. Yeah. All right, Chris, um, I'll uh, stick around after the recording to talk to you for a second, but uh, I really appreciate your time and uh, thank you for spending time with the dickheads and uh, for all the dickheads out there, keep it paranoid. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thank you very much.